an absolute honor to be here. Um, I know I stand between you and lunch. I know you've, just like me, been through a kaleidoscope of strong ideas, uh, a tour de force of concept around health. I have something else exciting to tell you about. Bear with me. Um, I want to tell you about what we mean by bioelectronic medicines. I'll do that by first explaining a little bit what it is, and then why you should be excited about it. I'll give a couple of examples from a patient perspective, from a therapeutic effect perspective, why this, what this could look like. And then I will finish by describing the, the engineering challenges that we're currently tackling and why uh, GSK and Verily have joined forces here over just the last quarter to form a company dedicated to build bioelectronic medicines. Bioelectronic medicines are tiny active implants that will be sitting on or near a nerve that goes into an organ central in disease. So this is an artist uh, example of what this could look like. You have here a little electronic device that will sit on a nerve. In this case, it goes to the carotid body, and I'll come back to talk about the carotid body a bit later. Uh, the treatment that this device will deliver will be electrical impulses. Uh, it will modulate the electrical signals in those nerves, up or down, in some instances changing the patterns, and that will be the treatment effect. Why is that, why is that big? Why is that an interesting idea? Why can that have a big treatment effect? I'm going to go back to something that uh, Marco mentioned here with uh, musical sound waves as a therapy. Most of the uh, therapies we think of today are molecular in nature. They're small molecules, they're large molecules, uh, they are nucleic acids that we heard a bit about this morning, they can be cells. Um, but we believe that electrical impulses can actually reach much further in terms of being used as a treatment modality, as a treatment entity here in, in treating various chronic diseases. Just like Mark was mentioning, the, the sound waves. So sound waves and electrical impulses. Think of them perhaps as a, uh, a new molecular entity. And it's not just any new modality. It, it actually has the power uh, that so much has fueled molecular medicine to bring the benefit that they do. Um, and that is a power to link into a control system that already exists in biology. Uh, I always think of it as a dirty little secret of, of molecular drug discovery that, discovery that used to be my, my field, that you actually you, you piggyback on nature. You're not as smart as you pretend to be. You don't really design the molecule from scratch to have an effect. No, instead you, you tap into something that already exists. That's why uh, small molecules have, have actually done uh, wonders in, in, in many diseases for, for over a century. You, you plug into a signaling cascade that can be inside cells, it can be between cells, it can betwe be between organs, but you tap into that. Uh, and that's why we've seen a revolution in uh, various uh, immune system linked and antibody mediated therapies over the last three decades. Uh, it's because we can tap into the, the response that the body uses to, to invading uh, so you, 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 you take a monoclonal antibody and that then has an effect in the body because it, it taps into that natural control mechanism. Peripheral neuromodulation has that same fundamental benefit. We are looking at uh, tapping into nerves that actually only have one function. I mean, there, there are electrical wires, if you will, that crisscross our entire body. They go to organs and from organs and they are there for control. So the body has used it all along. That is what we're trying to use therapeutically. Not only does that provide a, a, a new axis of control, a new class of, of potential treatments, it also brings precision, we believe. Uh, and there are some fundamentals here uh, that, that, again, works in our favor. If you take a molecular medicine, you may um, orally take the medicine, you may inject it, you may inhale it, but one way or another it, you, you get a, a fairly systemic exposure. You flood your, your body, if you will, with a molecule. Um, and then the, 
the, the medicinal chemists and the pharmacologists and so on work hard to have a bit more effect on, on the, the target protein and the target organ you want than in the rest of the body. The great benefit of targeting peripheral nerves near a particular organ to affect a particular function that you're interested in to restore in health is that you have that natural spatial precision, the branching of the nervous system. So when you affect something, you affect something in one place. And you actually have also the temporal precision of electrical signals. This is not a slow process. This is a continuous tuning of the different functions in the body. And by, by modulating those electrical signals, you can actually personalize something in the long run here uh, to, to a high degree. So that, that is sort of the, the theory, the fundamentals why uh, precision peripheral neuromodulation can, can have a significant effect. This has started to become a, a quite expa rapidly expanding field. Over the last five years or so, a number of researchers have started to come together, uh, form a, a research roadmap, if you will. There's significant public funding that is going into this area, both in the US and here in Europe. The, uh, NIH, DARPA, uh, Horizon 2020 have programs behind it. Uh, and we're starting to see uh, translational players like Galvani Bioelectronics coming into being. What are then the, you know, what does this look like? I, I want to give sort of a bit of a scientific anchoring and, and sort of a patient view here quickly. And I'm going to give two examples. I'll give the example of rheumatoid arthritis and type 2 diabetes. Rheumatoid arthritis, as many of you know, is a, uh, an autoimmune disease where you have a, a, a pain and degradation and inflammation in many of your joints. One of the culprits in such a disease are so-called pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, mediators that drive inflammation in those joints. Now, how can you, how can you, th th these, these are molecules produced of cells that are circulating around. You may ask, what, what's the neural connection here? Well, here, here is a, um, a scheme of such a neural connection. There is, from the brainstem, so the 10th cranial nerve, called the vagus nerve, sends electrical signals. It connects in a junction box called the celiac ganglion. The splenic nerve sends more signals. In the spleen, uh, various immune cells that uh, was mentioned this morning pass through. Uh, T cells react to uh, the, the neurotransmitters. T cells program macrophages. Macrophages then produce these uh, problematic inflammatory mediators. So, if you have a neural signal here in this vagus nerve to, to splenic nerve, uh, that acts as a break on the production of these inflammatory drivers. Now, what, what I will show you next is some uh, data from a uh, startup company in California called Setpoint Medical, who've been first out in the clinic here to really test the, the, the power of this axis of control. Uh, and they've done it in a small set of patients, as you always do to begin with, so you have to treat with this with a big uh, caution, but I, I think it still gives us a reason to believe uh, in the translational potential here. So they, they first worked with eight patients who um, were resistant to the first line of medication called methotrexate, um, and these eight patients had an implant that stimulated on that top nerve, the so-called vagus nerve, uh, it's a nerve bundle that has a number of functions, but this company believes it can, can have a setting for stimulation that, that gives a selective effect on uh, the cytokine suppression. And what they saw in six of the eight patients is a suppression of their disease score. So uh, each of those lines here to the left is uh, a patient. If you're up in sort of the five to eight range in these DAS scores, you have very problematic rheumatoid arthritis. And six of eight patients saw a, a decrease here down towards the remission state. For those of you who are in, uh, in clinical practice, this is about the same magnitude effect as we see with anti-TNFs. The company then took a second cohort of 10 patients who had been uh, resistant also, or are resistant also to these biologic treatments that are the state of the art of rheumatoid arthritis treatment today. Um, and I don't have the data up there, I have a patient up there instead who bravely talked about the effect these implants had on her in an article in New York Times a couple of years ago. So Mirella here had been on nine different uh, rheumatoid arthritis treatments. 
She still couldn't hold a pencil and write, and she was sort of bound in her home. She had an implant, and allegedly, she, she could very quickly after the implantation and the treatment started cycle to the Dutch coast. She lived in Amsterdam, so she could cycle to the coast 20 kilometers and back several times a week. These are anecdotes, of course, and this needs to be proven out properly in, in control and randomized trials. But uh, I think it goes to show a, an intriguing link here between uh, immunology and the nervous system. A second concrete example, type 2 diabetes. Uh, type 2 diabetes is, you know, a, a, you know a, a systemic condition that involves many organs. Um, you can affect it therefore at different neural intervention points. One beautiful example of the power of peripheral neural modulation uh, in early research is from a, a talented professor called Sylvia Condi at New University of Lisbon. Uh, she has stimulated or blocked the electrical signals in a nerve from something called the carotid body. So carotid body that I mentioned right in the beginning has a, a sensor in our carotid artery and then a nerve sends signal to the brain stem that controls a number of organs. What the experiment that was done here was that electrical stimulation was put on the nerve uh, to block the electrical signals. These signals go up in type 2 diabetes. In, in animals with disease. And on the, the right, you see an experiment with rats that have type 2 diabetes. They, they are on a high-fat, high-sucrose diet, um, like many of us are today. Um, <laughs> and they, not surprisingly, they, they get insulin resistance. So what you see in the, the graph is that they have a degree of insulin sensitivity, they're on the bad diet for three months, and their insulin sensitivity goes down. You then switch on this stimulation uh, on the nerve that I mentioned to block the electrical signals. And these rats stay on this diet. They keep on eating high fat, keep on drinking uh, high sugar, uh, and their insulin sensitivity comes back. Then you switch off the stimulation, and they stay on the diet. And you know this is an important control. The, the, the diabetes comes back. right? Early experiments, rats, we're looking to translate this, of course, into to patients, but it shows the power of, of neural control again in a disease that people are not necessarily think can be controlled by the nervous system. It doesn't stop there. Uh, this is a map that is so detailed you can't really read the, all the names of the organs. I just have it up there to say virtually every organ in our viscera are innovated. These conferences sometimes I find are, are a bit macabre because every speaker tries to say, you look, the thing I work on kill more people than the, 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 the thing that the, the previous speaker talked about. Um, I'm just going to continue that. Look, the, the, the organs in here are central in chronic diseases that cause a lot of trouble. It's not going to uh, solve all medical problems, but there's a lot of ground here to understand the individual nerves. What do they control in physiology and pathophysiology, and how can we turn that, that into therapies? So, we need to build devices that do this. The good news is that devices that, that modulate the body's electricity exists already, has existed for, for decades. There are pacemakers, cochlear implants. There are uh, devices that interface with the nervous system in, in deep brain stimulation, in spinal cord stimulation. And there even are devices that are on peripheral nerves uh, to, to stimulate or block signals. The, so whatever frontiers is, is not so much to, to get you know, a first manifestation of such implantable devices. It's to get them specific, responsive, and uh, compatible enough with really low burden surgery so that this isn't the last resort in treatment. It is something that actually can have the sort of precision benefits that I talked about before and we can introduce early on. So here there is lots of great engineering work going on at the moment. For example, how do you create the neural interfaces, the, the, the sort of the first hardware that touches biology when it a soft, squishy, one millimeter nerve somewhere in our bodies? How do you interpret various signals, including actually the underlying neural signals, and make these treatments responsive? Use that, that power of uh, the speed of, of electricity and real-time control that I alluded to before. And how do you shrink these devices? How do you go from the hockey puck device 
with big leads and big open surgery to something that can be introduced in a safe, reliable, rapid way through keyhole surgery. Those are some of the challenges that, that we now are working hard on to crack. And it, it brings us to why we decided to form uh, Galvani Bioelectronics here a few months ago. GSK had done extensive work over uh, a few years now looking at what diseases, what nerves are linked to what, um, what uh, physiology and pathophysiology, the sort of data that I was showing before, had an extensive network of collaborators in that space, uh, and of course a long-term mission to build uh, therapies. Verily, that just described so, so brilliantly before, has been building up an arsenal of technologies that fit incredibly well with this problem really low power electronics, hermetic packaging, how to interface with biology, data in, data out, power in. Um, and we put those two strengths together. It's fantastic to, to be able to represent and lead a venture here that also have two such strategic and long-termist backers. Uh, these are our two parent companies that are in it for the long run and really want to do the sort of transformation of healthcare that I believe these therapies can do. So, to finish off, um, this is a partnered effort. This is uh, something we've built with partners throughout, and it will continue to be it. Uh, if you're interested in this sort of treatment potential, uh, if you want to take on some of the scientific, engineering, translational, surgical challenges that I described, do reach out to Galvani Bioelectronics, and we can try to make this a reality together. Thanks. <laughs>